So Lee, it's really great having you here today. It's great to be here. Um, at our uh, seminar, leadership seminar, philosophy and practice. Philosophy and practice, how does that actually fit together and what stands at the core of the seminar? I think more often than not, people can worry that the two don't fit together, that philosophy gets done over here and practice happens over there, right? But of course, one of the premises of the, of the, of the seminar when we put it together was there is a connection to be made, a connection that we actually owe our owe it to ourselves to make between the kind of conversation that we've had in the course of the day today, you know, where we invoke Aristotle, where we recognize that Kant has something to say about how people behave and daily engagement in the workplace, in the home, right? But that, that understanding some of the questions that lie behind the things that we do on a daily basis without thinking about the, the reasons why we do those things or the implications of what we have done, you know, that we need to make that connection. Um, thank you so very much. Uh, today, um, there was a lot of discussion about human nature um, and the structure of society. Um, is that something which is relevant today? Uh, it is perhaps more relevant today than it has ever been. There are a lot of theories about what it means to be human and how humanity is different from the rest of creation, including the things that we ourselves create, right? So if you think about the the, the, the debate And it is really a debate around the nature of artificial intelligence and the possibility of sentient artificial intelligence, right? The, the question of who we are as human beings, as a species, and how we relate to the world that we are both living in and creating as we live in it seems to me fundamental. So, yeah, I would say it is a, a matter of significant concern and opportunity. That is, if we recognize that we have a number of different ways to qualify what it means to be ourselves, both individually and collectively. We free up the possibility to do things differently. And we know that there are a lot of things we do we don't do very well, or we do flat out badly. And, and one step towards changing that lies with thinking about codifying anew our understanding of what it means to be human. You've been teaching or moderating the seminar for quite a while. Um, <laughs> um, the last years um, have seen a multitude of crises, um, health crisis, pandemic, um, now the war, um, and decision makers have to make decisions under high un uncertainty. Do, um, if I may say, old texts from Aristoteles and Plato, can they help decision makers today? Yeah. From the get-go, when Aspen was founded in the U.S. In, in the late 40s, early 50s, right, the premise has been that going back across the centuries, so two millennia plus to Confucius and Aristotle and Plato, made sense because the issues that those writers raise continue to bedevil us, that is, and, and, and sometimes I, I don't want to cast it as, as purely negative, Uh, it's also an opportunity again. So there are ways of thinking about the world that have been in conversation for millennia, and they are both limiting and freeing. And to read Plato on the structure of society and to consider his choices and to look at where we are today, what choices we have made, the degree to which we even have recognized that we're choosing, right? Those readings make it possible for us to understand that we come in a long line of debate about a range of topics, and Aspen identifies them. You know, it's individualism, collectivism, freedom, community, right? And questions of equality, justice, right? All of this has always been on the front burner for people who think about and who have written about what it means to be human and what it means to be an individual in society or a society made up of individuals. And is there also diversity in the reading? <laughs> yes, there is diversity in the reading. Yeah, some, so yes, absolutely. Some of the readings that you find in the, in the executive seminar, and I haven't taught it in a while, so I don't know what, the, what the, the curriculum there looks like anymore, but our seminar, Philosophy and Practice, traded on That, that seminar with a, a twist towards more German readings because the seminar happens here in Germany. 
but I would say that, that the, the diversity component does surface both across nationalities and across questions of gender and race. So it's there. We have, we have modernized uh, to a considerable extent. So again, saying that you have done the seminar a lot of times, what makes you come back to Germany and continue moderating the seminar? I enjoy coming to Germany. That's the starting point. But every seminar is different, right? And it is true that we use the same texts <clears throat> from one seminar to another. It is equally true that the participants at the table are different. And that is a different kind of diversity, but one that really does matter. Every seminar brings a new set of faces and experiences and opinions to the table. And the negotiating, as we all do in the seminar, across those sometimes, I, I guess I would say tense moments. There are times when people do clearly disagree with one another. But those moments generally yield to a broader sense of community, however fleeting, right? The seminar lasts three, three and a half days. It's not a, uh, it's a weekend. And yet in that time, every time people come together and establish a sense of community that I think makes it possible for us collectively to agree to disagree at times, but also to recognize that we agree on many things and that those agreements are empowering, which is, I think, what we want the seminar to do. And I can just say the seminar is also special because we have you as a moderator. Um, thank you so very, very much um, for My doing pleasure. it over and over again. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.